Hello, Engineer Elnaro. Uh, I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction uh, to what we've been working on at Lenaro. Uh, I mean, it's a big community effort. Lenaro, Intel, Red Hat. People have been working on what's called the ADL uh, for over five years. So it's, it's very hard to actually summarize it in 30 minutes, but let's try. All right? Uh, I'm assuming because the Red Hat is one of the conference here, and you hear it, probably people know what operating systems are. Uh, people have general concepts of what CPU and what scheduling is, right? I mean, raise hands if, if that's not a good option. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what is EAS? Energy Aware Scheduling. So, it started with, uh, interest in EAS started with uh, when ARM about six, seven years ago came up with this architecture called Big Little. What Big Little is basically it has. In, in, on the same CPU complex, you have very high power uh, CPUs and low power CPUs. So, in, in, from the Intel world, uh, think of it as uh, like you have uh, Xeon and Atom on a single CPU complex. All right, Atoms are low power, can't do as much processing as a Xeon, and both of them are in the same CPU complex. Now. That is, but, but EAS is not restricted to Big Little. We just start thinking about EAS as a result of Big Little, but it's not restricted. Okay? Um, suddenly, because you have like a Xeon and so in, 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 in ARM's case, uh, they have like Cortex uh, A57, Cortex A53 on the same CPU complex. Um, suddenly, it becomes very important which CPU your task runs on. Because the big cluster, the, the, we call them the big cores, which are like very, very uh, uh, powerful cores in terms of processing, but they're also very, very power hungry. And on the flip side, the little cores, they are very, very power efficient, but they can't do as much processing. So depending on your task, you have to figure out where to place that task. Think about a CPU scheduler. That's the main task for the CPU scheduler. Take all the processes you have running in the system and put them on all the CPUs, distribute them across the system. So it became very important how to do that. And uh, so throughput was not the only metric. Before, I mean, six years ago, throughput, how quickly you can run through all the tasks on the system was the only metric used by the schedule. It had to be fast. Over scheduler, if you have heard of it. It was always about throughput. Now suddenly we are talking about energy efficiency of, of, uh, of schedule. So, from a history lesson, uh, what happens is there, there are two key frameworks uh, to doing power management inside the Linux kernel, CPU Frack, CPU Idle. CPU Frack is uh, essentially scaling your CPU frequency, right? So, like running at 200 megahertz versus running at 2 gigahertz. Depending on what, how much processing power you need, you scale it down and uh, you get, uh, you say how much coming back instead of uh, four hours of battery life, you might get eight hours because you scale. So that's CPU break. And CPU idle is when you have nothing to do. You idle this, you shut down the CPU, you shut down the caches if possible. So, so think about it this way. You see, the, the Linux editor is trying to uh, move tasks around. Right? You have, let's say you are an eight-core system. Very typical in On your laptops, on your, even your mobile. You have a core system and it's picking tasks and putting them across all these systems. Right? And CPU back and CPU idle are trying to save power at the same time. But they are not talking to the schedule. So scheduler moves the task from CPU 1 to CPU 6. The CPU back and CPU idle after about 30 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, it makes sense they are doing runs. And then, oh, something changed. And then they suddenly scale the frequency, or uh, because they are like, oh, that we need more processing power on CPU 6 because we move the task there. So we need to increase the frequency on this one. And oh, oh, by the way, we need to actually make up this other CPU because actually CPU 6 was sleeping. So we need to actually make it up before we can actually do anything. More. There was a lot of latency with this because it was already reaction. But scheduler was not talking to the power management of the system. So everything was reactionary, everything happened after 100 milliseconds, which is a lifetime in, in kernel space, in, in, in hardware space. It's a lifetime. So, I don't know why my introduction is so 
before and a couple other guys. But that's me. Um, yeah, so I, I just want to talk, <laughs> talk to you about the, the problem of EAS. And it's not meant to capture all the details of uh, So this is what it looked like. The scheduler, I just described to you, right? The scheduler is doing task placement. You have CPU idle. The menu governor, which which, uh, which is like an algorithm, it says, OK, CPU is idle, shut it off. The CPU fret with an interactive governor, on demand governor, uh, which has a similar algorithm, which is running in its own uh, time scale. And it's, it's saying scale must be because uh, since you have this CPU scale down, since you have that CPU, it's going to be none of them is talking to you. Um, if you think about the problem, if you keep thinking on the problem, it's so obvious that actually the schedule is the best place to make these decisions. Because the schedule is the one picking a task. So it's like, okay, you already know that I'm picking a task from CPU 1. Moving it to CPU 6. So I know that CPU 6 is going to need more processing power. And if there is no more task left on CPU 1, you can actually idle CPU 1 right away. You don't have to wait for 100 milliseconds to make that mistake. So the schedule is actually the right place to make this That's when we started working on EAS. So this was our code. That there would be the scheduler would have some sort of energy performance metrics. We had to teach the scheduler about what energy efficiency was. And then the scheduler would sort of program. Start finished. I mean, six years and we are still not done. Okay. So, um, six years ago, we were like, okay, we will solve this problem, right? We are going to fix this problem. We are going to do some things and, and get this done. So, we started with some piecemeal approaches, like, okay, we have this in kernel switcher. Uh, which basically created a virtual uh, uh, operating point for the big and little uh, cluster. And we are like, okay, this, this is going to solve all our uh, scheduler problems and uh, energy management problems. Then we came up with this thing called small task packing because there was a lot of very short-lived, small uh, housekeeping tasks that are constantly going on in the operating system if you ever track it. If you run, like, timer fires off, it does something very quickly, goes back to sleep. Thousands of these going on all the it's like okay, all these small tasks, we want to move it to the little core and avoid waking up the big cores so we don't burn too much power. Right? So it's we call this small task packing. So we're like, okay, let's pack all the tasks onto fewer CPUs so you can put enough of them to sleep. The big core you want to keep them asleep as long as possible. Until you start running your 3D So that was the whole object. Then we there was this crazy idea of having completely separate power schedulers. Okay, so we like ideas. Uh, I by the way was uh, the tech lead of the team here at Lenaro, the uh, power management team when we were doing all this. Um, Imo Mona, Red Hat, he is uh, the scheduler maintainer. This is what he said. Uh, can you read this at the back? So he said because I'm not going to read it because he but he essentially said you guys are idiots. Okay, I'm not going to accept any of this. And essentially what he said is this policy belongs in the cellular. For a very long time, power management people and regular people have been doing things on their own. So they're going out and doing something here. These guys are doing something here. These guys don't know how to talk cellular language. Cellular people don't know how to talk power management language. We only care about our own domains. Let's start collaborating and coming up with a heuristic which actually lives in the cellular. So essentially, everything that we had done so far, it was about a year's worth of work. It's like nah. Okay, nah. We are not going to accept this. Come with a better design. This is 2013. Back to the front board. And by the way, the other problem was um, that everything that we did could not address existing systems. So think about all the old Intel PCs that you have, laptops you have, that cannot address anything. So you have to come with an engineering solution to to add energy efficiency without replacing anything. Nothing, no, no additions are acceptable in terms of throughput performance. For sure. is the most important, uh, I mean efficiency in the scheduler is, is like the most important of the year. That wasn't an option to replace uh, a few percentage points of performance just to get better energy efficiency. Because 
Uh, Linux is used in data centers and servers, so all the users in Facebooks and Oracles would kill us if we, if we send a patch which would actually reverse their workload by 3%. We don't do that, I don't know. So, now I'm just going to quickly talk about the things we actually ended up solving along the way in the last decade. Um, and that's, that's basically it. I'm going to just tell you this is what we saw if there was something that was So, first thing is the scheduler had no concept of uh, all the topology of the CPU. Uh, do you know what a CPU looks like? Uh, eight core CPUs, okay? So, what you have is typically um, you might have uh, four CPUs which share cache, right? And then these other four CPUs share another cache, right? <coughs> And then all of the eight of them share another level of cache, right? There's a hierarchy. So all this information, the scheduler did not know. The scheduler only knew about one of eight cores. He did not know that there is a cache, there is a cache hierarchy, and uh, caches by the way consume a lot of cache. Of course, our management people consume like, a lot of cache. We want to shut off caches. But we cannot shut off caches until all the CPUs that share that cache are off. We have the first <coughs> CPUs, then I can shut off that level one cache. Then I, if the other four CPUs go off, then I can shut off this other level one cache. And then all of this is off, then I can shut off the level. That's the deeper C states. We call them the C states in, in uh, ACPI. <coughs> so there was no concept of power topology. We, we taught the kernel <coughs> about power topology. Uh, so there's a SD share power domain, so it's a schedule of flag. Uh, which, which then allows you to define these topologies. We, yeah, at this level, everything is shared. At this level, these bits are shared. So it now knows about it. Then we next assume that all cores are equal. Because before that, everything was equal. Even you know, if you ran an 8 core Xeon system, each of your CPU was capable of, let's say, 2 gigahertz. Every one of them would have reached 2 gigahertz. Everyone had the same performance, everyone had the same uh, power limit. It was all equal. With big little that changed. Heterogeneous systems that changed. Suddenly, the power characteristics and the performance characteristics of CPUs were different. So you had to teach it about that. So this, we taught it through this thing called asymmetric CPU capacity flag. And uh, on, a, on a normalized scale of uh, 0 to uh, 1024, basically uh, you pass that information to the kernel when you boot up, saying that if I have eight CPUs, the first four are performance 1, 0, 2, 4. It's a normalized scale. And the other four are performance 5, 1, 2. Okay. These are roughly they are about half the performance of the first four. So you are essentially. So, what uh, does mean to say that the and the yeah, so previously the cores were not equal. The question was, uh, I mean, is that how the vehicle is handled, right? And yes, so now uh, by, by passing that information, uh, you can tell that uh, this is this is a weak core because they are all 0 to 4, and this is a weak core because they are all 0 We get that has come up with a, what I like to uh, call as a thin middle rating, so it's like three different uh, so you can have three different performance states. So there are three clusters, and they all have different performance characteristics and power characteristics. So in that case, it will become like 5, 1, 2, 7, 6, 8, 1, 0, 2, 4, for each of the states. So once, uh, this is an extremely hard problem. Assuming that all cores are equal is for so ingrained into the economy, those are that assumption was made every year in the night. All the load capacity, all the load calculations was, was based on everything is equal. So now suddenly you are saying these are not equal. You have to start thinking about CPU capacity. How much capacity do I have on this particular core when I move in this task? So can I, the big core can probably take uh, 10 tasks. Uh, let's say they are all equally uh, uh, equal strength tasks. You can take 10 tasks, but the middle core can only take 4 of those tasks. Right? Now you have to start thinking about the overall max capacity of each of those things. And teaching the schedule that has taken us to make a part of three years. We did all those things. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, 
then there was the integration of the IT class. So, um, previously, as I said, CPU IT was a completely different subsystem and so many. We moved all of that IT code into the scheduler part. So, scheduler would actually trigger the IT, the events that you were talking about. Analyzes 
tasks or no fault of the task. The task is not actually running a busy loop and taking more cycles. It's actually the CPU frequency that has gone down, which was not in the control of the task. So the penalizing part means that some tasks may not get a CPU time. Exactly. Exactly. So that's what I could not see here how you are taking care because the time still seems so easy. Oh, no. it's, 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 it's basically a, um, a factor, a multiplication factor that you, uh, you multiply the load with that multiplication factor for that uh, for that particular CPU. Okay, yeah. and that sort of normalizes the, that creates a source. Okay, so it's, it's a factor that you uh, pass as part of the boot up. They are saying that on this CPU, this is the multiplication. And then we came out with a lot of tools because this was obviously everybody wanted to be able to test it and verify that what we were claiming was true. So RT app is a uh, application used by the real time folks. Uh, we took that. We added the ability to simulate all kinds of machine models and mobile browser. We took data and used it to make that And then modular automation is a, is a harness, this harness uh, to automate all these things. So literally, uh, you curl with our patches, you could fire it off and it could come back to the design saying that patch is less schedule the performance on system which by 0.5%. Okay. So, take out all the manual. So, problems still being discussed. This is my last uh, slide basically. Energy model. Energy model is essentially the cost of running a task on a CPU at a particular frequency. So, in terms of energy, in terms of joules, how much, how much energy are you consuming? And then that table is normalized. So at 100 megahertz, uh, this is the cost of keeping this CPU alive. At 200 megahertz, this is the cost. At 300 megahertz, this is the cost. And you translate that into a normalized scale again. That's a table that's passed onto the planet. This is it's a very tricky problem because uh, how, how to pass this uh, uh, and become the magnetic platform agnostic. So it is not inaccessible. But that, it's a harder characteristic. How to make sure that this, this table can be passed to Windows or Mac or so come up with an animal for that. Parallel is, is a PSP topic by itself. It's basically uh, the load packing uh, in between the kernels. Uh, this is how all the how uh, you do all the task uh, uh, accounting. And so for interactive workloads like this, it takes about 32 milliseconds for a task to register in it. Because it's this uh, curve that it right, uses, it's, it's a decaying curve. Uh, and uh, it takes about 32 milliseconds uh, for, let's say, you tap your screen. And if your browser opens up, it's going to take about 22 milliseconds before the scheduler will say, oh, browser, there's going to be a lot of computing. I need to scale up my frequency from 500 megahertz to 2 gigahertz. And that results in laggy performance. You said, hey, something what was going to do. Yeah. So interactive workloads, it's, it's very important to quickly shoot up to your highest frequency, address the issue, and then go back to zero. So that's something there. And then a shared tune, again. People want to be able to tune this for different workloads because it, this is not going to work across uh, server workloads and uh, mobile workloads. It's very different type of workloads. It's So uh, you can group them into C groups and then add C groups to them. So these are things that are still being discussed. Uh, these are some uh, references. Uh, so I'll share this already with the audience. If you have a question. That's it. Right now, your phones are in your pocket, but you're constantly updating your email. 
doesn't need to be on your report. Yes. So there's a single creator for all these little background tasks. So you don't make these things up. So the way Android does it is through single. So I think they have the foreground and the background uh, single groups. Foreground, background, and I think that is what you Yeah, I think they're interactive. Yeah. But yeah, that's 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 Exactly. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I recently noticed that even the Pixel 2 and the Pixel series which came, they also have implemented ESS. Yes. Uh, were there any benchmarking tests which <coughs> could give like how was EAS compared to HMP which was the yes. original one? Um, look at the references in the slide. Uh, it will take you to some of the blog posts. I have written about this over, over time. Where you will find benchmark results. And the patches we have posted, we have actually published benchmark results on uh, non EAS solution versus EAS. It was like uh, 18 to 20 percent power savings. So it was, it was massive. At, at no cost of work even. Exactly. Close to no cost. Exactly. And uh, one more thing would be like I, if I have to generate an energy model for my SOC. Yes. Uh, how is it possible? Is there any tool for that? Because uh, there are tools. Uh, well, the tool is not a tool. <coughs> it's more like a, it's like a Python uh, uh, pie book. And you can uh, literally, you can, uh, you have to measure it uh, physically. You have to like sit with a voltmeter and say that, or talk to your hardware designers. It's like, okay, tell me what are the uh, characteristics and the so normal systems we get No, you, you can do it. Uh, we actually have a talk at uh, one of the Lenaro Connects. Uh, one of my colleagues actually gave a talk on how to create this without talking to hardware and how to instrument your board and measure power and come up with that table. It won't be like a perfect table, but it will be a good approximation. You will get 80% of the way. And it's good enough for uh, most of your years. And uh, if I'm shifting, like let's say 3.18 is my color If I'm trying to shift my HMP <laughs> to completely <laughs> EAs. <laughs> uh, uh, I would suggest uh, so 4.14 uh, is the kernel version in which uh, uh, Google has finally merged the EAS patches. So if you use for, if you basically move your base to 14, anything before that complex are off. It is already such a complex I mean think about five years of getting stuff upstream. You would require a company uh, with, with red hats uh, um, you know, manpower <coughs> to do all the backports for the schedule or just to make it work on the creative basis. I won't even go there. So one guy is practically a lot. Uh, I, unless you like your sanity. Uh, but yeah, otherwise just move to a 414 kernel, move your base to a 414 kernel. It's difficult to put all the patches of 310 or 380 into 414 at the same time. Upstream in the first place. <laughs> I wish I was in the OEM department. Alright, any last questions? Thank you very much. Patra, I am not Atish Patra. I am Siddesh. Uh, so Atish did this presentation uh, at the RISC 5 workshop in IIT Madras last month. And I am not going to run through this presentation. Uh, this is essentially a plug for uh, people who are interested in contributing to the Linux card. Show of hands, how many people uh, came here looking for ways to contribute to the Linux card? This is amazing because uh, this, uh, at least part of the slides that, uh, uh, oh, I don't work for Western Digital either. So uh, that's not me. And neither am I Damien. <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, how many people know what RISC-V is? Oh, that is, that is really amazing. Right? Uh, for the people who don't know, uh, this file is an open source instruction set architecture. How many people know what an instruction set architecture is? That is even better. Amazing. Right? So we are like almost halfway there. We have cut down our template top to like six times. Right? Uh, so this file is an open source instruction set architecture. Uh, it was developed in University of California, Berkeley, and it was developed as a teaching aid. Right? Because all the instruction sets at that time. Uh, that they were using to teach were way too complex or had some kind of packing issues that they, that they could not use to you know, build their own microprocessor core in house. Right? That is the reason why they built RISC V. And uh, they built RISC V with the aim of it being as simple as possible. Right? And even today, if you look at the RISC V instructions, it's under 100 instructions. 
things, right? Also because it is a relatively new ISA. But then it's, it's less than 100 instructions. And the best part about it is that uh, ISA is open source. So if you are a CPU manufacturer, I doubt if most of you are in this room, uh, but you could actually develop your own microarchitecture and use the RISC V instruction set architecture to actually interface with the programming world, right? So uh, Western Digital is one of the companies that's heavily involved in development because they want to uh, use the RISC V ISA internally. Uh, and for that reason, uh, there's a, okay, so I'm not going to uh, talk about why Linux and all of that because you guys already know that, you're the kernel of, right? So I'm going to jump directly into what is required, right? And uh, I'll skip the user space as well, but you can come talk to me if you uh, are interested in that. So uh, Western Digital, Google, a bunch of companies are actually interested in this file as a way to build their own microprocessors and uh, uh, basically develop their own application-specific microarchitecture as well, right? And uh, to that end, uh, a lot of people have contributed uh, things to the Linux uh, to enable the RISC-V uh, architecture. And there's a lot of things that still remain to be done. Because it is such a new architecture and it's such a new ISA, uh, there's a lot of scope for newcomers to actually get involved and uh, help out. So one of the things that uh, uh, Atish told me is really, really interested in getting people working on is uh, a workflow risk, right? So right now, uh, it, it uses a proprietary uh, boot loader format, and they want to move away from that to something that is more standard. Uh, so something like U-Boot, and uh, they also told me offline, it's not that on the slide, but you told me offline that something like EDFI would be awesome, right? Uh, so if you are interested in boot loaders, uh, I suggest him, I think Atish is there. Uh, you can talk to him and uh, get started on that. Uh, there's also CPU topology support, uh, something that uh, uh, Amit uh, talked about uh, just now. Uh, power management uh, and a bun bunch of uh, basically fine tuning of uh, the kernel for that uh, ISA that we can actually work on. Then uh, there's also advanced memory uh, related uh, support, like huge pages, for example, is not uh, there in uh, the kernel for S5. I don't think we have hardware that actually will benefit from uh, huge space support at this moment. But then it could be something interesting as a college project or something like that. If you if you if you're interested in learning how huge pages work, work and how the transparent huge page support in the kernel works, uh, this would be a good project uh, to start on, right? And uh, then there is a lot of tracing and debugging, right? Uh, tracing and debugging. A lot of people look at it as a peripheral function. But if you ask any uh, uh, any software developer working in the industry, uh, their hope or wish is that I wish we had tracing and debugging first, and then we would start developing the software. But almost always it's usually the other way around because functionality is the king for businesses, and they want to get functionality out first, and then you know, the, the infrastructure to trace and debug uh, programs that based on that. So there's, there's a bunch of uh, things in there. There's KXX, there's KPROBS, there's KGDB. Uh, PPF and EPPF is like the up and coming uh, way to do uh, tracing in the Linux kernel. So that's, uh, there's a lot of very interesting uh, PhD graduates, I think, uh, who have uh, worked on this. So you have very nice community to interact with the, uh, within the ABF, EPPF uh, uh, area as well. So as for hardware, uh, this file, if you're looking to get on, uh, involved in this kind of development, as of now, uh, there is, well, I can say for all practical purposes and for their modules, there is no hardware available. Right? There are two boards available and they're about $3,000. So uh, if you can afford it, great. But uh, otherwise, you have FPGAs that you can buy and go and have a uh, FPGA image on it. Uh, I think low risk is one image that is known to work with some settings, some uh, FPGAs. Otherwise, the best way to get working is by using QME, uh, which is a virtualized environment. And uh, there are some work areas in QME as well, which are they showed in a different slide deck, which I don't have here. But uh, again, that's that's also 
from an area where you can get us at the world. So that's it. That's, that's all I have for uh, rest five and the turn on rest five. And how long did I take? Five minutes? Awesome. Great. Uh, any questions? Uh, do I have time for questions? Or? Yeah. Okay. So any questions in this? Uh, I'm sure if Yes, I am aware of it, but I am not involved in it. I mean, how could we get in on it? Okay. Any ideas? Right. So there is there is a big bucket project uh, where they have dumped all of the uh, very log files, right? Uh, they have also formed a company, and I forgot the name of it. Uh, I actually uh, attended one of their talks during the uh, risk five. No, this was in night when was last year, uh, last month. And uh, that is going in full swing. They have some four variants of uh, processor design. And uh, they apparently have funding from DRDO to take out at least a subset of it. Yes. 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 So uh, there is an open source project for it. Uh, it's on big bucket. Uh, the ISA obviously is open. Uh, if you can read the very log files and understand the pipeline structure and so on, you can actually port that to different. So that is one of my pet projects, right? Uh, which I have only in my head, okay. and I have not done anything about it. Is uh, there are a bunch of gym, uh, simulators, right? Uh, there is a simulator called Gen5, for example. Gen5. Gen so what Gen5 allows you to do is it allows you to build a processor pipeline. Okay. And uh, you can build a processor pipeline as long as you have the ISA support for it. So for Gen 5, you need to add a RISC-5 ISA support, and then you can build a Shakti pipeline on top of it, which would be a really cool thing to do, just that I don't have any time to do it. So if anyone's interested in doing that, you can get in touch with me, and we can figure out a way to do it. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks.